On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, why is nearly half of the world ships flagged in three nations? I am your host, Adam Coglano. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. If you're new to this channel, take a moment and subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So I read a story in Maritime Executive that made me ponder a question that many of you may have out there. Why are most of the world's commercial ships flagged in three nations? And it's not three nations that you would commonly associate with maritime dominance. Look throughout history, you've seen maritime powers, Greece, Venice, uh, the Netherlands, Great Britain, the United States. But today, the top three nations are Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands, not exactly known for their maritime dominance throughout history. But the question is, why? Why do those three nations have a almost monopoly right now on fleets and commercial vessels? And more importantly, what's the deal behind it? So let's take a look at this story. So the story that got me thinking about it was this one here over on Maritime Executive. Executive Achievement, Alfonso Castillo, COO for the Liberian Registry. And this is an interview with Alfonso on his transition over from the Panama flag to the Liberian flag. And I just want to read some parts of it because it really got me interested in this. And I, I was like, man, if anybody else reads this, they would not appreciate or understand what he's saying here. So after having run the world's largest ship registry, Panama, Alfonso Castillo came over to the Liberian registry eight years ago with a single goal in mind, make it the biggest and the best. He gives a little background on himself, and I'll have the link in the story so you can read it. But he's talking about the fact that he worked over in Panama. He was enrolled in the Naval School, worked for, for some shipping companies, came back to Panama. And he talks about his time when he was made the Director General of the Panama Registry in 2008. Uh, and he says, in those six years, you transformed the registry and have elevated it to the Paris and Tokyo whitelist and implemented a number of cutting edge technological achievements as well. And you were barely in the 30. Yes, we had to change some of the rules governing ships in the registry to get those things done. For example, we helped pass Panama Maritime Law 57, which allowed officials to unilaterally cancel the registration of non-compliant ships. We couldn't do that before, and it was necessary to achieve the white list status. And I'll explain what the white list status is in a minute. Why'd you leave? You were running the world's biggest registry. What could be better than that? Well, you need to understand that in Panama, everything is run by the government, including the ship registry. So there's a limit to what can be done. You can't hire the best people, for example, because you can't afford them. When Liberia came along, I was presented with a totally different opportunity. The Liberian registry, big point right here, is completely independent of the Liberian government. It's based in the US outside of Washington, DC. It can hire the best qualified people in the world and implement policies that are in the best interest of the shipping industry and seafarers themselves. Safety measures, environmental requirements and living conditions on board. It's a public private partnership with the best advantages of each. I would argue it's not really that much of a partnership. So this was a chance for me to really make a difference, to be an example of what can be done. It was an opportunity to build the world's best ship registry. And so I jumped at it. So every ship has to be registered. You have to fly a flag off your vessel. If you don't fly a flag, you're unregistered. You are basically illegal. You fly technically a black flag. This is where piracy comes from. And up until World War II, the predominant na maritime nations were nation states. It was Great Britain, number one, the United States, Japan, Germany, Italy, France, the Netherlands, you know, Norway, Greece, nations you would commonly associate with. But during the period of World War II, there was a change. The United States was one of the key proponents of this change. Because of World War II, because of neutrality laws, the U.S. was constrained in who it can trade with under the laws passed during the 1920s and 30s. However, with the fall of France, with uh, Nazi Germany blitzkrieging their way across Western Europe, we needed to get supplies to the British, but we couldn't do it on American vessels, and the British were running short of out of vessels. So Franklin Roosevelt found a way to get around that, and that was through the Panama Registry. Panama, which was a very small registry at the time, he came, went to several shipping companies, particularly some oil companies, and said, can you shift ships over to the Panamanian Registry? crew them with Americans and Panamanians and ship over things like 100 octane fuel. And that 
worked great. It, it got around the neutrality laws. And post-World War II, we saw an explosion of these open registries to the point we're at today. This is from the Review of Maritime Transport, uh, the latest one in 2021. And here you see the leading flags by registry. Number one, Panama. Almost 8,000 vessels, 8% of the world vessel total, 16% of it by deadway ton tonnage, 344,000. Key thing here is the growth in deadway tons. The Panama registry has increased by almost 4.5%, a little over 45 4.6%. Liberia, nearly 4,000 ships, 300,000 deadway, uh, uh, three, three, it's actually 300 million deadway ton because that's in thousands. 14% of the world's fleet, they have grown by nearly 9%. Then the Marshall Islands come in at 12.8%, they've increased by 4.7%. When you add those three up, they represent 43% of the world's merchant fleet. And again, they are growing substantially. We can expect them to see have an even higher percentage come 2022 when the next report comes out. This chart from Review of Maritime Transport shows ownerships of the world fleet by country. And you'll see right there, Greece tops it as number one. But it breaks up the tonnage there in terms of national flag vessels versus foreign flag vessels. So you'll see that, for example, in Greece, nearly 85% of their fleet is foreign flag. Go down there, China is about evenly split between foreign flag and Chinese flag. Japan at number three with about 85%. And then you see the rest, Singapore, Hong Kong, Germany. Germany is 91% foreign flag. Republic of Korea, 82%. Norway, 97%. Bermuda is down at 99.5%. And then when you find the United States at number 11, 81.09% of the U.S. fleet is foreign flag. The U.S. has a very small national flag fleet. So that brings us to what the interviewer was talking about in that piece of what do these registries do and, and why would you register in Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands? Why would you not fly an American flag or a British flag or a German flag or a Chinese flag or a Russian flag? Why go to those countries? And when it comes down to it, it's money. It, it's that simple. But there had been issues with registries in the past. Uh, if you look at, for example, from the 1960s to the 1970s, there were a slew of tanker disasters. Nearly all those vessels were Liberian registered. Even the Deepwater Horizon in 2010 was a Marshall Island registered vessel operating in the, in the Gulf. Now, that doesn't mean that just because you're a foreign registry that you are unsafe, although for a long time there were issues associated with that. But today, one of the things we've seen is a improvement in the stature of those vessels. So when the United Nations came into being, one of the subsets of the United Nations is this, the International Maritime Organization. This is the UN entity that's supposed to provide rules and controls over shipping in the world's oceans. And one of the things that they have established is this, what's called port state control. And this is the inspection of foreign ships in national ports to verify the condition of the ship and its equipment comply with the requirements of international regulations and that the ships are manned and operate in compliance with these rules. To do this, there's a series of memorandums of understanding, nine of them to be specific, and they are listed here on the side with links to them. So, for example, you have the, 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 the Paris MOU, you have the Tokyo MOU, you have a Latin American, a Caribbean, a uh, West and Central African, a Black Sea, a Mediterranean, an Indian Ocean, and the Rihad MOU, which is the Middle East. And then the last one is the U.S. Coast Guard and their Port State Control Office. And what they do with these port state controls is this gives authority to the regulations and regulatory bodies in ports to go on board foreign flag vessels and ensure they're being operated to standards. And what they do is they issue these notices, these lists. So for example, the Paris MOU, which is one of the most uh, biggest ones, issues what they call this, their white, their gray, and their black list. The white list are those vessels that have basically proven themselves to be good and in compliant 
with all issues. And that was an issue that was mentioned by Alfonso here uh, about this. And they have the list of vessels that, or nations that make the white list. Denmark is number one right there, but you'll see the Marshall Islands at number three, go down the list. Number 12 there is Liberia. And at the very bottom of the list is Panama or set third to bottom at number 37. And so all these MOUs will publish these. And what this allows nations to do is target flagged vessels coming into their ports for inspections. So that if you had a ship on the blacklist, for example, you would know that they have not been compliant quite a bit. Now, the Coast Guard has their version of this under the Coast Guard webpage. You can go here. Here's the Office of Commercial Vessel Compliance. And it lists all this information. So for example, they have domestic and offshore compliance sites right here. They have their port state control office right here where you can look at that, including the issuing of annual reports, which I'm gonna come back to here in a second. They have here flag state control. Uh, they have fishing vessel safety, policy guidance, uh, headquarters contact list, basically everything you, you need right here to be, be able to see everything. And you know, in this, they have a whole variety of issues that are associated with the inspections of vessel. One of the things they list here are flag state detention. So you can pull this up and see vessels that have been detained by this. I got to say, I pulled this up during my research for this video, and I was kind of surprised to see that back in April, two MSC vessels were flagged for issues and basically uh, under detention. These are supply vessels that support the U.S. Navy. Back in February, the training ship Golden Bear was list listed. Now, obviously, the Coast Guard's going to inspect U.S. vessels, and you expect this. But if you look at their annual report, which was a really interesting uh, read for me, I took a look at this uh, annual report. And one of the things I wanted to show you here is one of the things they list here in their highlights, which I found extremely interesting in how many vessels are being inspected. And you'll see right here in vessel arrivals and detentions. In 2021, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, a total of 10,945 individual vessels from 81 different flags made 73,974 port calls to the U.S., of those, 8,663 port state control exams were conducted. Now, that doesn't mean physically bored, but that means uh, they were doing uh, uh, conducted drills or uh, certification of the vessels. Despite the ongoing global pandemic, these exam numbers increased over the 2020 total and surpassed the 2019 total. Total number of ships detained in 2021 for environmental protection, safety, and security-related deficiencies increased from 57 to 63. And this report, which again is, is in that area, and I'll have it listed here so that you can take a look at it. So here they broke down where the deficiencies are. You know, one quarter were for fire safety, another quarter for safety management systems, 11% for life saving, 7% for propulsion auxiliary machinery. There were structural issues on 5% of the vessels, along with emergency systems, and then 4% international ship port facility security, weather tight conditions, work conditions were only 3%. And so it gives you an idea of what the Coast Guard is looking at. And the same will be done in other nations around the world, according to those MOUs. And the goal here was to raise the standard of international ships, especially those ships that were in open registries or flags of conveniences, such as Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands, and ensure that ships operating in territorial waters of nations met minimum standards. So let's take a look at the three registries and what's really unique about them. So this is the Panama registry. So Panama is based in Panama. This is the where the registry is located. And when you look at the registry, you'll see right here, it gives you a list of total vessels, gross registered tonnage, and the income to the federal treasury. And that's a big thing about the Panama registry. Panama derives its wealth from three places. It derives it from the registry, it derives it from the canal, and it derives it from tourism and the export of some products. And obviously the Panama registry is a big one. It is controlled by the government and the government, as was stated in, again, the uh, statement here that we saw before, Panama's control, you know, they, everything is run by the government. And so very hard to make changes 
in the Panama ship registry. We've also would argue that the Panama ship registry is not one of the best ones for investigation of issues. For example, still waiting on the Panama registry's investigation of Ever Given from two years ago almost now. The other registries are, of course, the registry in the Marshall Islands. Now, the Marshall Islands is the newest of the three registries, really came out in the 1980s. And initially, the Panama, uh, excuse me, initially the Liberian and the Marshall Island registry were operated by a similar company, but they split. They uh, cut loose from Liberia IRI, which is the International Registries Incorporated, and now they solely do the, the Marshall Islands. And they do everything from uh, ship registry, including large vessels to yachts. If you ever look at, you know, below decks, a lot of the yachts there are registered in the Marshall Islands. And the reason they do that basically is to, you know, it's, it, it's cheaper. You can figure out, you know, right here on their, their homepage, tonnage calculator to determine how much you're going to pay for that. The other reason the Marshall Islands is really enticing to a lot of people is because the U.S. government has a unique arrangement with the Marshall Islands. You'll see right here, in 1947, the United Nations assigned the United States administering authority over the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, which included the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The Compact of Free Association between the US and the RMI entered into force in 1986. The compact reflects that the RMI was a sovereign nation in free association with the US. An amended compact went into force in 2004. Go on a little bit here. The RMI government conducts its own foreign relations consistent with the amended compact. Under the compact, the RMI and the U.S. agree that the U.S. has full authority and responsibility for the defense and security matters in and relating to the RMI, the Republic of Marshall Islands. In addition, eligible RMI citizens can travel to the United States without visas to live, work, and study. RMI citizens can also serve in the U.S. armed forces and volunteer at per capita rate higher than any other U.S. state. Understand what this means is under this free association, the U.S. can go into the Marshall Islands, Kwajalein, and conduct military and security operations. At the same time, we agree to protect the Marshall Islands, which in, in terms is extended to their vessels. One of the things the US military was trying to come up with in the 1970s and 80s was with the decline of the US commercial fleet, largely due to the fact that it was really expensive to operate US ships because you had to pay US taxes and US, US mariners, US wages, well, they were trying to operate under this effective U.S. control, these ships that were owned by U.S. citizens but flagged in Honduras and Panama and Liberia. Well, the Marshall Islands is even better because the Marshall Islands gives you this basic de facto control for the U.S. government. They love this. Now, the headquarters of the Marshall Islands Registry, the International Registry uh, incorporated is not in the Marshall Islands, even though you may say on the back of your ship, Marshall Islands. It's actually located right in Washington or just outside of Washington, D.C. in Reston, Virginia. And so this is the headquarters of international registries. The third registry is the Liberian registry. And the Liberian registry is, is really unique. Created back in the 19, late 1940s at the end of World War II, uh, Secretary of State Edward Stinettis, while flying across the Atlantic, stopped in Monrovia. And at the time, Liberia was one of on only two independent countries in the African continent, the other one being Ethiopia. And Liberia had been established by the United States as a basically a place for repatriated slaves from the U.S., but Stenatis saw an opportunity here for two things. Number one, how do we provide Liberia with income? And he believed the ship registry was a great way. Second, it gave him a foothold in Africa in the Cold War. This would get Liberia really ingrained into globalization and the world economy. And he also saw it as an opportunity for a registry that can be used outside the U.S. flag. And one of the, the, the kickers here for the Liberian Registry is their, their moniker, all flags are not alike. And man, I, I, I agree with them. Uh, they're not all alike. Plus the Liberian flag looks a lot like the US flag. It's an American flag with just one star in it. And if you've ever traveled on cruise lines, a lot of them are Liberian registered.
And again, one of the things that these registers do is not just flag registry, but they do certification for mariners. They do incorporation of articles for businesses. And so this registry is a massive registry for a variety of reasons. If you look at this about, this is right from their, their website. It talks about their re registry and, and who they are. But I wanna talk about a couple of key things here on their registry. The Liberian Registry is administered by the Liberian International Ship and Corporate Registry. This was created on January 1st, 2000, when the International Registry was basically kicked out. Uh, it is pri a private US owned and globally operated company. LICSR is internationally recognized for its professionalism and commitment to reducing redundant workforce procedures in order to increase efficiency. Well, there's a couple of interesting things about this company. This is from their history of the Liberian program, which goes into that detail. In 1959, Liberia became a founding member of the International Maritime Organization, which again is a unique thing. The IMO is represented by nations, but Liberia, Panama, and the Marshall Islands also operate these registries that are private entities. You know, under Panama, it's a government corporation, but Liberia and Marshall Islands have these entities that these corporations and these corporations represent their nations on the IMO. Uh, this is the uh, thing that gets me right here. Since its inception, the Liberian registry has been operated from the United States. In fact, the US structure and principles governing the administration of the Liberian registry are embedded into Liberian law. Pursuant to these statutes, the registries must be principally operated from the US and managed by international maritime professionals for the benefit of the people of Liberia. The strong US Liberia Alliance provides the registry with the ability to participate in international arena with key industry institutions. There's almost no connection with the Liberian registry to Liberia. And, and this becomes readily apparent as you look at this. This is their vessel registration department. This is basically how they do things. And one of the things they have here is this annual fee calculator. And so one of the reasons why you see these companies go there is, is just manifested in this calculator. If we put in here the calculation for a ship, let's say 100,000 tons, which is a kind of a good medium sized vessel. And you enter this in here, you'll see where you save your money and why this is. So, for example, in your registration fees, registration fees, administrative fees, certification fees, they're waived. Uh, consular fees, third party fees, notarization fees, not required. Total registration fees waived, you've saved $14,000. If you look at annual fees and taxes, you don't have to pay consular fees. You don't have to pay agency fees. You don't have to pay annual maritime compliance fees. And oh, by the way, Liberia, which again, headquartered in the United States, is has a, a reciprocal trade agreement with China so that when you do this for China and you, again, you type in here a 100,000 ton vessel, what are you saving in Chinese uh, tonnage duties? Well, yearly, you're saving $135,000 if you're a Liberian flagged. And again, if you look at their global offices, this is from their site, you'll see their global offices are everywhere, South America, United States, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and then right here down in beautiful Monrovia. And if you listen to, you know, and you look at the website here and you look at everything about them, again, you'll see that you can, you know, contact them uh, all the time. They have all their offices listed. Their main headquarters is right here in Virginia, in Dulles, Virginia, but they have offices all around the world where you can contact them. You'll see them listed everywhere here, all around, including right here in Monrovia, West Africa. However, I should note that 80 Broad Street in Monrovia, West Africa doesn't exist. It doesn't exist at all. This is uh, Monrovia right here. And if you look at 80 Broad Street, it is a false address that doesn't really exist in the area. There, there are numerous stories that talk about this. Uh, this is the International Bank of Liberia. This is at 50, uh, 64 Broad Street. There's no 80 Broad Street in, in Liberia. There, there's almost no connection the Liberian registry has with Liberia. And matter of fact, if you look at where the Marshall Island registry is, 
and the uh, uh, Liberian registry is they're 12 minutes from each other outside the Beltline in Northern Virginia. A quick little drive will get you right there and you'll be there in absolutely no time whatsoever. And this is one of the key things here. This is, this is the trick that they play with these registries. Now, don't get me wrong. The registries provide you with a huge benefit with lower operating costs, lower transportation costs, but they are not true state registries. Again, Liberia and Marshall Islands is operated out of Virginia. And so those two entities uh, are, are, are you know, doing this for the benefit of those islands. And I'm sure some money gets to Liberia and the Marshall Islands, but this is obviously a business entity that's operating these vessels. And they have a huge play in this. Again, they represent 43% of the world's merchant fleets. Liberia, Panama, and Marshall Islands have seats on the International Maritime Organization. The U.S. has a seat at the International Maritime Organization. It's represented by the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard, it's not the U.S. biggest U.S. company that does it. Yet IRI and uh, Liberian International Registry Ship Corporation are on the, on the IMO. And so this is one of those weird things that exists in international shipping that most people don't know. If you're really interested in this topic, let me recommend this. This is Rodney Carlisle's book, Rough Waters, Sovereignty and the American Merchant Flag, done by Naval Institute Press. I will have it in the show notes. Great book, breaks this all down, talks about this registry, actually does the history of American sovereignty and registry, but the last chapters look at the issue of Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. Just a great book, and I strongly recommend it. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, head on over to the Patreon page. Become a patron and support the page. I want to take a minute and thank my patrons who joined over the past month back in May, Paul Dachau, Jeff Loveless, uh, Bill Madden, Matthew Gustafson, Pegleg Pete. I, I love that name. I'm sorry. I just it's one of the ones uh, that gets me every time. Uh, Richard uh, Netberger, Philip Burnside, Alexander Hickman, uh, Dave McHugh, Richard Marcotte, Shelley Lyle, CJ Halton, Coral Shell, Matthew Harmon. So I want to thank everybody who has uh, joined in and all my previous patrons who are in there. I appreciate everything you do. Always great to have you guys and ladies as part of this. I couldn't do this without you. It means a great deal to, to have the support from my Patreons who uh, do this for me. It's, it's always uh, fantastic to have you as part of this. And again, to uh, all of you, uh, wish you the best. And until the next video, this is Sal, signing off.